High above the village of Golsby is Ben Braggy. On top of Ben Braggy is a statue of George Levison Gower, appointed Duke of Sutherland six months before his death in 1833. He looks out onto the land his money and his wife cleared during the Highland Clearances in the 19th century. The statue referred to as the Manny is much hated in Scotland and the surrounding areas, and dogs and men are encouraged to relieve themselves on the side of the statue. The Highland Clearances change Scotland and the world forever. Find out how and why in episode number 25 of the Scottish History Podcast with me, Owen Innes. For around 110 years in the aftermath of the failed Jacobite uprisings and the Battle of Culloden, Scotland was forced into the period we now know as the Highland Clearances. The Act of Proscription was introduced in 1747 to take away the Highlanders' identifiers such as their dress and their language, and by 1750 these same peoples started to be forcibly evicted from the lands they had lived on for generations. The laws were changed. Your laird was now no longer your protector. Your laird was now a rent collector. You now had no claim to that land. Now these Scottish lairds and landowners set about to improve their land. Not improve it for you, but to improve it for them. For money. They would now evict you and replace you with sheep. The Highland Clearances took place over two phases. The first phase began really before the uprisings in 1745 and as early as 1710 when the land of the Campbells of Argyll started being placed up for auction to the highest bidder. From 1760 until 1815 the first phase was in full effect. At this point the Highland peoples were being taken from their larger plots of land and being brought together to make up crofts but with shared grazing fields. The land they were moved from again became sheep grazing land and deer were also introduced. The first phase was categorised more as relocation rather than eviction. Phase 2 between 1815 and 1860 was the more aggressive of the two phases. As the population of Scotland was rising and wartime industries started collapsing, specifically the price of wool and cattle declining, The lairds or landlords started the process of evicting people from their lands so that more animals could be moved in. More animals, more profit. Some evictees were assisted in their evictions by being paid passage to the new world. If you chose to go, then you went. If you didn't, then your home was burned down and you were left to fend for your lives and you would essentially starve to death. This particular process was very common during the Highland Potato Famine of 1846 to 1855. A lot of the peoples that were displaced during Phase 1 were also moved to fishing areas where kelp fishing was common. This alleviated the need to find or make jobs as they were available already in these areas. The kelp industry thrived between 1815 and 1820 but by 1821 it had completely collapsed, leaving everyone without work and in poverty. Even the landlords in those areas were led to bankruptcy. The main reason for the clearances was an economic one. 
but was also due to discrimination still to the Catholic Highlanders, and that a lot of landlords held the belief that the Catholic Celtic race was inferior to their lowland Protestant peoples. The most famous example of the Highland Clearances happened in Sutherland in Murray. The name Sutherland came from the Viking settlers on Orkney and Shetland, as this land tended to be the furthest south that they would travel, so therefore the Southland or Sutherland. In 1785, Lady Elizabeth Sutherland, the landowner for about half of the whole county of Sutherland, married George Granville Levison Gower, the Marquess of Stafford. In 1803, Gower inherited the large fortune of the Duke of Bridgewater, a very good thing for the fact that the Sutherland's estate was in massive debt. Gower and his wife put the money to use to improve the lands. The first of their clearances began in 1807. Lady Sutherland believed that the lands were overpopulated by people, and also her lands were prone to famine. The price of wool had skyrocketed since the 1780s, so now was the time to take advantage, as they could charge higher rents for a sheep farm than they could for the crofters. The first clearance was to be in Laird, which counted the removal of over 300 Highlanders from the land. Many of these people decided to emigrate, much to Lady Sutherland's apparent displeasure. In 1809, William Young and Patrick Seller approached Lady Sutherland and offered their services insisting they would have instant results and by 1811 they were both now in charge of the factor. They opened a coal mine in Brora and other small businesses to prevent the displaced Highlanders from deciding to emigrate. At Ascent in 1812 was Young and Seller's first clearance which had the displaced settled in a new fishing village by the coast. In 1813 they then set about clearing the Strath of Kildonan which was met by riots from the locals who refused to leave. Eventually the army were called in after six weeks of rioting to negotiate. These negotiations involved paying large sums to the displaced for their cattle they would have to leave behind and landlords from the surrounding areas offering them land and also if they wished passage to Canada. Lady Sutherland once again was shocked to hear about the riots as she believed these displaced people should see them losing their homes and land as a positive thing. In 1814, Seller was responsible for the clearing of Strathnaver and Brora, with over 2,000 people being cleared. On this occasion, on the 13th of June 1814, Baden Loskin House, owned by William Chisholm, was being cleared. The clearing party set fire to the roof of the house, whilst Chisholm's bedridden mother in law was still inside. When Seller found out, the woman was rescued, but died six days later. This led to Seller being charged with culpable homicide and arson by local law officer Robert McKidd. In 1816, Seller was acquitted of all of the charges. Robert McKidd had, however, in the past been caught poaching by Seller, and McKidd wanted retribution for this. But after the acquittal, McKidd ended up leaving Scotland completely after sending Seller a letter of apology and a written confession of poaching. After this debacle, Sellers was sacked and replaced by Francis Souther and James Loch. Loch oversaw the largest part of the Sutherland clearances from 1818 until 1820. Due to famine in the area, the thoughts on emigration had started to change, now, so to the point that now the estate would not object to the displaced emigrating, However, they still would continue to not promote emigration as an option. Loch also introduced the lowest rents for the new crofts to persuade people to leave. In 1818, 220 families in Sutherland in total were evicted. In 1819, that number rose to 425 families. In 1820, 522 families were displaced. Francis Souther in 1819 continued to use fire to drive people from their homes. 
This coincided with a season of very dry weather, leaving Sutherland covered in a thick smoke. To the locals, 1819 became known as the Year of the Burnings. The Sutherland clearances effectively ended at the end of 1821. However, small-scale evictions continued for at least a further 20 years. The clearances as a whole affected the Highlands greatly, and their effects can still be seen today. If you travel north from Perth or Stirling on the main roads, you'll be met with nothing but open land for miles upon miles. A couple of small and sparsely populated villages is near enough all that you'll find. You will, however, see sheep and cattle galore. To give you some numbers, around one-third of the population of the Scottish Highlands lives in Inverness, with the total Highlands population of around 140,500 people. Compare that to Scotland's overall population of 5.5 million. It's barely a drop in the ocean. In all of the research that I've done for this episode, two terms constantly came up. Where the term Highland Clearances sounds not too bad, if we were instead to say the ethnic cleansing or genocide of the Highland people, you would not be far off the truth, according to their dictionary definitions. This time was a horrific and telling time for Scotland, and not very many people know the truth about it. I do, however, implore you to read up more on the effects of the clearances to help you understand more about it. Because of the clearances, the Isle of Skye pre the clearances had a population of almost 50,000 people. Today, it's less than 9,000 people. Around the world, 200 million people can claim Scottish ancestry which is 40 times the amount of people that actually live here. The popular folk song Loch Lomond actually deals with the clearances. The, the, the song is a story about the clearances. Now, obviously, I'm not referring to the run rig version, uh, which is quite a party tune. I'm talking about the original folk song. The original folk song is something that I have planned on analysing at some point. It's something that I used to do when I was on tour. We used to go through the entire song and analyse each line of the original folk poem and, uh, and explain, obviously, what each line means. But also, uh, in more recent times, there is a song called Letter from America by the Proclaimers, who are by far one of the greatest Scottish acts of all time. Uh, and uh, Letter from America also deals with the issues of the Highland Clearances. For Letter from America, I will link that in the social media accounts going forward so that you can have a listen and try and work it out for yourself. So in the introduction, I did mention the Sutherland statue. The Sutherland statue was placed up there uh, via subscriptions from the people of Galsby and around the UK. This was paid for essentially by the people, but it's not something that really nowadays people want to see. In the nearby village, however, of Helmsdale, the emigrant statue dedicated to the emigrants forced to leave from these lands is situated. The emigrant statue in Helmsdale does have a sister statue, which is an exact bronze copy, uh, which now resides in Winnipeg in Canada. However, there are plans to also have one in the USA, in Australia, and in New Zealand in the future. If you are from Canada, or you have visited either of the statues in Winnipeg or in Helmsdale, please post your pictures on the social media accounts on the Facebook or on Twitter. Let me see them. Let me see your pictures uh, and your memories from being there. So folks, you know, that's been a long time coming, the, this episode on the Highland Clearances. It's such a difficult topic to talk about because um, it's so in-depth. So I, I hope that I've managed to uh, um, do it justice. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, I hope that you go and, and, and have a look a little bit further into the, the history of the Highland Clearances itself 
Um, there are plenty of books um, and everything about it. I'm sure there's also a book specifically just about the Sutherland clearances. Um, it maybe doesn't sound quite as brutal as it actually was from my description here. Um, but uh, trust me, uh, a lot of the other stories in which I've heard, it's, it's, it, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. Um, so I do recommend that uh, you have a look into it yourself uh, and once again as a sort of a little reminder folks uh, obviously I know that we do have a lot of um, international listeners especially from America, Canada, Australia and New Zealand etc. Please just remember folks I am not a genealogist, I'm a milkman with an interest in Scottish history. I was a tour guide um, however of course uh, COVID-19 happened so I am no longer a tour guide uh, I do this in my spare time now um, so I'm not a genealogist so please don't send me messages uh, or anything saying you know what do you know about the McLean clan because I'll know as much as you do by essentially going online and, and having a look um, I don't mind talking about them uh, but I'm not going to be able to give you any further information than what you can already get um, available online um, but in terms of the clearances, you know, if you have a look, if you are looking through your uh, genealogy and things like that and you find out that, you know, your family moved over from uh, somewhere in the Highlands in 1818 or 1819, for example, you know that it was probably as a result of the Highland clearances and that affectionately they were in a way forced um, to, to leave this country. Um, and uh, here's hoping that this uh, COVID thing will be over fairly soon and that we can start getting visitors back in so that uh, those of you that I know want to come in uh, uh, and see more of Scotland can finally come back again. So uh, so we'll wrap that up there, folks. Uh, once again, uh, I mentioned uh, please post uh, your photographs of the, um, the emigrant statue uh, if you do have any. Uh, or either of the statues on the Facebook page, so that's facebook.com forward slash Scott History Pod. We're on Twitter, uh, you can use that to contact me as well, so that's at Scott History Pod. You can email me directly if you have any uh, direct questions that you want to ask, that's Scott History Pod at gmail.com. Uh, this podcast is available on numerous podcasting uh, apps, for example, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. I think we should now be on Amazon as well, Amazon Music, uh, Spotify, uh, and every single one of these episodes gets uploaded onto YouTube as well. Um, so if you prefer to listen via YouTube, uh, then you've got that on there. I... I'm going to try start making some video content. Uh, I might do a sort of a, a studio update kind of thing in terms of, you know, how I record these podcasts and things like that so that you've got a visual. Uh, earlier on in the week, uh, I posted a video on the YouTube and up on the Facebook page. Um, I helped uh, Alan from Our History, Your Story on uh, Facebook. He goes around the country and he does videos from locations and things. This week he decided to do Glencoe. So he was up in Glencoe talking about the Glencoe Massacre. And uh, you can see me on there towards the end. Uh, and also Julie from Exploring Scotland's YouTube channel, which I've been um, getting into. Uh, having a look at some of the uh, her, some of her videos there, some of them are absolutely amazing, especially Killarn Castle uh, around Loch Awe, the longest uh, loch in Scotland. So, I've been really enjoying her videos as well. So head over there. Uh, one last thing, if you do wish to support the podcast in any way, there is a way in which you can do it. That's via the Patreon page. That's p a t r e o n dot com forward slash Scott History Pod. And you can support the podcast monthly. That's either £1 per month or £3 per month. Uh, regardless, I think, of where you are in the world, it will automatically uh, convert to your currency. Uh, but I just keep it nice and low um, so that, uh, you know, if you can afford it, then great. If you can't afford it, then please do not worry about it. You can continue to listen for free regardless of where you listen to your podcasts on. So... 
once again, folks, thank you very much. And uh, apologies for not uploading on Sunday night. I usually record over the course of Saturday night. And there was a party in the building in which I live in. So, um, yeah, loud music until about 5 o'clock in the morning. So I wasn't able to uh, record. I had to eventually give up and just go to bed. Um, so once again, folks, I will speak to you next time, hopefully uh, again uh, on Sunday. So thank you very much and take care. Cheerio.